Hello, good ladies and gentlemen. Today in Misunderstanding Jung, we will take a swing at the collective unconscious, because based on personal talks and experience, it seems to me that it is his most widely recognized concept, which is also, in my opinion, frequently misunderstood. Now, I do think the best way to familiarize yourself with Jung's concepts is to actually read him, but he does have a peculiar way of explaining things, so I thought I would take the time and try to explain some of his concepts in the hope that it might help illuminate his ideas for a wider audience. Anyway, check out my other videos of the channel if you haven't already to listen to Jung himself explain it. They are in the description below. Okay. So, the quick rundown for the collective unconscious is that, given that our mind has evolved, it makes sense that there would be some things in all of our psyches that are essentially identical. I mean, we all have two eyes, two legs, fingers, brains, though the latter may not seem that way always. Similarly, our psyche, which is really just an emerging property of our brains, as I have slightly touched on in an earlier video, will have modules which are pretty much the same for everyone. Given how one of the most remarkable faculty of human consciousness is that we can think abstractly and create models of the world, and even concepts, the idea behind the collective unconscious is that we also have a great number of common themes or similar conceptualizations called archetypes. These, in turn, then, are so similar that manifestations, instances of them, seem to appear from time to time in our life, and, because different events are recognized universally by us, it is thus fair to say that the archetypes exist, in a sense, and they appear in our lives. Now, I would like to clarify here that you should not think about archetypes as, say, similar to Greek gods, and that they have a will of their own, free choice and feelings and such, and that they form our world to do their bidding. No, they are merely concepts that are universally recognizable for all humans. Not unlike the concept of a table and food upon said table. Every human will recognize a table, just as everyone has clear notions of what food constitutes, and will recognize given instances of food if they meet them in their life. Yet, we wouldn't say that food somehow has a will of its own, and that it finds itself appearing on tables all around the world, even though if we look around, we would find lots of tables with food on it. I hope this simple example does not feel too forced, and helps you think about archetypes in a less mystical and more clearer way. Now, let's further investigate this through a few examples. Allow me to roll out the big guns first. Mary as an example of the mother archetype. Ah yes, now you might say that Christianity is really just one woman's lie about an affair that got seriously fucking out of hand, and while that is certainly one way of looking at it, you do reach Captain Hammer-like levels of literal mindedness if you do so. Because that is really missing the whole point. I think our disposition to think about things like this has to do with the current zeitgeist. Religion failed to deliver many things that people would have hoped for in life, like improved living conditions, improved healthcare and longevity, etc. Some of which was actually promised in a way. And then science stepped in, and then did actually something about these issues. Religious thought has suffered from this science envy, as we may call it, ever since. This is, by the way, why some people who have faith place so much emphasis on trying to find a proper scientific explanation for God, and this, then, culminates in an obsession about issues not yet or not quite answered. A great example is how hard some religious thinkers try to fit God in right before the Big Bang, with a quite desperate God of the Gaps argument. By doing so, they hope to gain legitimacy in the eyes of reasonable or rational people, on the side that has been clearly winning recently. Now, this isn't done just to appeal to non-believers, mind you. No, I do think this is in fact predominantly done to satisfy themselves, their own need for what we may call rational faith, or religious rationality. 
They see the value in the scientific method, or science in general, and in critical thinking. Something they do not want to give up. So, they try to make ends meet this way. Trying to be rational about faith and God is not a bad thought, by the way. Saint Thomas Aquinas, in the 13th century, has put down this as a cornerstone in modern Christian thought, saying that reason is actually the primary way of finding God. Faith taking the back seat for those who may lack the capacity or affinity to dig into the arguments. This has actually been the very reason why the Enlightenment and all this scientific advancement could ever come to being in the first place. Because contrary to popular belief, the Church embraces theories of evolution, science, and all that comes with it. And this is why, in my humble and disinformed opinion, Bill Nye is doing a bad thing by duking it out with uh, quote-unquote Christians, because it makes it seem, at least at first glance, that this is what Christians actually believe, and this is what Christianity is all about. I mean, as stupid as it may sound at first glance, a mind-blowing revelation I recently had was that people do not actually believe in a sky fairy, and honestly, I doubt that this has ever been so except for perhaps the most um, simple-minded amongst humanity. Hell, some of the Greeks figured that the sun and the moon are just glowing rocks and not deities at all. Now, this does tie back to Mary, because saying that Christians of the past have been deifying a cheating wife-to-be is uh, somewhat analogous to this. So, let's give some credit to historical figures and let's not assume that they were all drooling idiots. The truth is not represented on a one-bit grayscale. All right, so back to Mary. While pointing out her infidelity is edgy and all, Mary is much more than that. Mary is not a woman. She is a manifestation of the mother archetype. And I would even go so far as to argue that Christians, and Catholics in particular, don't even worship Mary, but rather they pay their respects to this mother archetype itself. When I realized this, it has changed my perspective on Catholicism immensely. Recently, long story, I attended a few Catholic masses, and it was perplexing just how similar the language was to what Jung describes as archetypes. Obviously, they have other words and expressions for some things, but seriously, if you can, go out and attend a few Catholic masses. Chances are you'll catch them talking about Mary sooner rather than later, and I think it will blow your mind. Hell, especially if you're not religious and have not done so in your life. If you have some time on your hands, look up your next church, bigger ones have daily masses, and just sit in there and listen with a Jungian mindset to what they are saying. Try to translate what they are saying in a manner that is closer to what is more along the lines of your thinking. It's an interesting thought exercise. You know, Worst case scenario, you will have wasted like two hours of your life and you can elaborate your terrible experience in the comments below and call me names or something. I'm sure it would have been better spent on browsing some memes anyway. So, they use expressions like mother of the word of God and referring to her as the heavenly mother of all of us. I mean, sure, you wouldn't bat an eye about her being the mother of God according to the scripture, but she is now the mother of all of us? Well, yeah, because she is the instance of the mother archetype, present in all of our psyches as a concept. Now, on a side note, I did hear a lot of things which sounded outright new agey, at least for my taste. For example, St. Michael's Prayer is a prime example which, although sounding quite awesome, has some lines in it which I do believe many take rather literally, which I would argue is bad. So, let's take a look at another archetype, the Paladin. Now this might be a bit of a hit and miss, but let me try to characterize a concept that I am quite fond of, which could be arguably called the Archetype of the Paladin. There are undoubtedly many names for it, but I will stick with this one, because I think it illustrates it better than a simple warrior or even knight would do though the latter is fairly closer to it than the former. All right, so we have a soldier, a battle-hardened man, or at the very least, someone who knows how to fight, 
who, however, is not motivated by material goods like a mercenary or sell swords would, or by fame and glory like a swashbuckler or a duelist would be, but who is rather strongly committed to something transcendental, something bigger than him. He is a man of faith. Just like the classical protagonist in the hero myth, he fights evil, relentlessly and without respite, and is working for a force of good. Interestingly enough, the portrayal of the paladin, i.e. an instance of the archetype, is something which I haven't seen done quite right in popular culture. In fact, he has received a rather bad reputation recently, often being called lawful stupid, and a lot of effort has been put into subverting the whole archetype. This, I think, is due to the general jadedness in our times towards anything regarding objective good and profound values. People simply do not believe that such a thing could even exist. Thus, the righteous is portrayed as self-righteous, something that is more believable for the average viewer than someone who not just genuinely believes in a good cause, but actually is good and does good, heavily implying that such a thing even exists. In a time where moral relativity has been the standard go-to, you can see why this would throw a wrench into the works of paladin portrayals. Now, I'm not saying this is bad, because movies and books would be rather boring if the protagonist would be essentially the same hero in different settings, but it does reflect how we think about these issues in general. So, I think this is why the PAL is somewhat underrepresented and good examples are hard to find. Not as all bleak, however, because I do think there are some examples which shine a beacon of what this archetype really looks like in life. Michael in the Dresden Files is a prime example of how to do this right. Another example would be Uther or even Prefall Arthas from the Warcraft universe. And some might argue that Captain America is also a paladin, but I'm on the fence with that one. I think he lacks the transcendental motives that are necessary to qualify as one but I will grant that he is pretty close to it. He might be the closest to a paladin out of the currently widely recognized hero fray, which also further reinforces my perception about the lack of faith, so to speak, in objective values. So, what do you think? Is the paladin a valid, universally recognizable archetype, or am I just forcing my fancy here? Feel free to drop a line with your thoughts in the comment section especially if you think you have some good examples I've missed. Okay, so having taken a look at these archetypes present in the collective unconscious, let me take you on a bit of a tangent here, so bear with me for a moment. Have you heard the story about monkeys on an island learning how to wash potatoes telepathically? Allow me to give a quick summary of it. So, in the 1960s, a bunch of scientists were studying monkeys on strictly independent islands, meaning that the monkeys couldn't even see each other. So, they started throwing some potatoes on the island, I mean, the scientists did, to give the primates something to munch on, and they were watching their behaviors closely. And the thing is, while potatoes are lovely, especially for the Irish, one of the monkeys learned, completely incidentally, that by washing them in the sea, they become much tastier than if they just try to crunch through all the sand every time they eat it. So, other monkeys on his island quickly started learning from him, as one might suspect. But here's the kicker, once enough of them started washing the potatoes, suddenly, all the monkeys on all islands started washing them, simultaneously. Pretty amazing, eh? Now, before this completely blows your mind, or before you say anything about how I wasn't entirely accurate about the story, keep in mind that it is utterly bullshit, a pseudo-scientific humbug. Similarly to how the, according to science, a bumblebee shouldn't be capable of flying story has made its rounds, this piece of disinformation has also been spread widely, and even worse, has been cited as truth by many. So, anyways, why am I talking about potatoes if I'm not explaining how to use a fractional distillation equipment? Well, this story is sometimes cited to illustrate how the collective unconscious works, because once enough monkeys started washing the potatoes, so the argument goes, it became a part of their collective unconscious, 
so it could propagate through to monkeys on other islands. But this is not how this works. This is not how any of this works. In actual fact, the monkeys learned the behavior because they actually could swim between the islands and the alpha monkeys who washed the potatoes with total bros and everyone loved them, so word spread pretty quickly. Thus, my point is, knowledge, once discovered and found by someone, does not become stored in the collective unconscious, like pictures of celebrities uploaded in the cloud to be discovered later. No, the collective unconscious isn't some weird brain internet that connects all of us. It can be thought of, however, as a collection of various seeds, each of which begins to grow and bloom once you are in an environment where certain factors, e.g. humidity, air pressure, ground acidity, whatever, are favorable to that particular type. So, this is why, if given factors are identical in two people, they might have psychological experiences that are insanely similar, as any psychologist could tell you. Okay. So, to give a few more examples, without much elaboration, of what the collective unconscious isn't. It isn't a magical realm that stores information. No, you cannot communicate with your long-dead ancestor through the collective unconscious. Similarly, you cannot communicate with living entities around the world through the collective unconscious. Yes, it is something that is common in both of you, and that is due to literally hundreds of thousands of years worth of evolution. But just because you both have eyes does not mean that A, you can see through each other's eyes, or B, you see the same thing. And it isn't something which exists in a different reality, or a different plane, or on Andromeda, or whatever. Really, to summarize, it's not this mystical, paranormal thing that influences us or even holds our life captive. It's just a set of concepts that are similar throughout humanity. Strictly speaking, one might discern different groups of humans and talk about their collective unconscious, like the collective unconscious of Europeans, Americans or families even, but that's, I think, a video for another time. Alright, I really hope you enjoyed this thought bite. I would also take this moment to thank you all for the kind support I've received so far. I do read all comments and appreciate them immensely, even if I don't reply to all. So if you have feedback, suggestions or ideas about what I should make the next video about, I'm all ears. I might do more explanatory videos like this and less audiobook type readings of Jung for now because the latter is more recording intensive, which I have less time to get to nowadays, while finding an odd hour for writing now and then is easier. Plus, I do think Jung went down a bit deep into the rabbit hole, but that's an issue for another time as well. Okay, thanks for listening, cheers people, and have a nice day.